from VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship. This is episode 10 of Circle of Willis, where I chat with evolutionary biologist David Sloan Wilson about multi-level selection theory and the ways in which scientists communicate both with each other and with society. Hey everyone, it's Jim Cohn. This is my podcast, Circle of Willis. Guys, I'm sick. Got a nose thing and a lung thing and God knows what else. Taking a lot of medicine and it's got me feeling a little bit funny. But if, uh, if my voice sounds a little off, that's probably why. Okay, uh, for this episode, I'm talking with evolutionary biologist David Sloan Wilson about, well, about a lot of things. I was, uh, I was at an annual meeting of the Association for Contextual Behavioral Science, or ACBS, and I spotted him there. I just went up to him and I, I sort of nervously asked him if he'd be on my podcast. And he said, sure. And the next thing I knew, we were up in my hotel room recording the conversation you are about to hear. Fun fact, this recording literally captures the first conversation that we ever had together. And I kind of kind of love that. As we enter the conversation, I ask him what he's doing at a psychology conference, and he, he sort of talks about his recent collaboration with clinical psychologist superhero Steve Hayes, the inventor of acceptance and commitment therapy, and, and an old school behaviorist. Turns out the two of them are working to reunite the sciences of Skinnerian behaviorism and Darwinian evolutionary theory, and I think it's long past due. This leads to a really nice discussion of how science progresses and how scientists communicate with each other and actually how scientists get their work out into the general public. That's good. Now, many of you will already know David Sloan Wilson because he's one of the biology's most prolific and impactful scientists. He's been in the spotlight for more than four decades now, poking holes in evolutionary orthodoxy with his uh, multi-level selection theory, which we also talk about, by the way. And, uh, and doing just a tremendous amount of work to bring the theory of evolution more broadly into the public consciousness. Just a few points to mention here, more than a few, as a matter of fact. David Sloan Wilson is Distinguished Professor of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University, where he started the Evolutionary Studies Program, also there. He's uh, written a bunch of books quite accessible books I highly recommend. They include Darwin's Cathedral, Evolution for Everyone, The Neighborhood Project, and Does Altruism Exist? The guy also founded the Evolution Institute, which has as its goal the application of evolutionary science to uh, to help solve serious social issues, issues that matter to all of us. And, you know, through that institute... He also publishes an online magazine called This View of Life. And there's more stuff, too. A bunch of more stuff, but I'm going to stop now. I'm going to stop because I, I, want, I want to get to our actual conversation. And I, I got to say, uh, in this conversation, I was a little starstruck. I was a little nervous. And I think, I think that might come through a bit. But, you know, whatever. It's good. My advice is to just listen to what the man has to say. There's a lot in here that even his harshest critics, I think, would want to high-five him for. And this is another episode where you'll want to keep a notepad handy. This guy is nothing if not quotable. All right? Okay? Here he is, everyone. David Sloan Wilson. So what led you to be working uh, with someone like Steve Hayes in a setting like this? I, I want to begin with a social history. Okay. Because Steve Hayes is a, is a s- ex-generation Skinnerian. That's and right. A lot of this emanates with B.F. Skinner. Yeah. And Skinner regarded himself as an evolutionist. Yeah. His paper, Selection by Consequences, more or less uh, staked out his position. 
But then this kind of weird history happened, and uh, and uh, Sk uh, Skinnerian uh, behaviorism was uh, eclipsed in academic psychology by the so-called cognitive revolution. Right. And it still found a home in the applied behavioral sciences. And then the cognitive re revolu uh, revolution was then critiqued by evolutionary psychology of the Cosmides and Tubi variety, yep, yep. and which then kind of demonized the so-called standard so social science model. And so you get this uh, bizarre state of affairs where what most people associate with evolutionary psychology is totally divorced, diametrically opposed to uh, Skinnerian it's incredible, Psychology. isn't it? It is incredible. It's incredible. I mean, it, it really became sort of oppositional also, I think, because people started associating anything having to do with evolution with, you know, sort of nefarious social programs that were going to, Well, there's you know, a big piece there. Let's ra set, let's, ra racism and yeah, sexism. Let's, let's set this aside for the moment. Uh, if we want to get back to it, we can. We can do a whole session on it. Uh, I call this truth and reconciliation for social Darwinism. <laughs> um, and so uh, the term social Darwinism <laughs> refers to basically the moral justification of inequality. Yeah. And, and um, uh, the, 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 the question as to whether it earned that reputation ever in its history is a very interesting history. So let's set that aside for the okay. moment. Okay, sure. Uh, but uh, so, so what my relationship with Steve... And other people like Tony Biglin and Dennis Embry represents is a, a reuniting of these traditions uh, as it should be. Um, so for a fully rounded evolutionary perspective on, on human psychology, it, uh, it needs to have that Skinnerian element uh, now elaborated because uh, uh, what Steve and company represent is not just the same old Skinnerian. There's this whole relational frame theory, yeah. this whole attention to symbolic thought, yeah. and so on. So it's definitely gone way beyond uh, Skinner. But in any case, that tradition is now fusing, thanks to us, back with uh, a more modern evolutionary psychology um, a tradition. And so that's why I'm here. And, and that's why... Uh, Steve and Tony and, and more or less made sure that I would be here and have, have uh, gone to great effort to to um, to do this integration through this great society, the Association for Contextual sure. Behavioral Science. And Steve and I are doing an edited book. Uh, we're in the middle of it right now called Evolution and Contextual Behavioral Science, colon, a reunification. <laughs> and the, and the, or fantastic. the organization of that book is that we are, for a number of subjects, we are pairing someone from the CBS world to, f with someone from the uh, evolution world. And each is writing an essay, and then we're getting them together for a conversation, an interview like this. Well, that's great. So, so yeah, the general principle, again, is like you were saying, the, the Skinner title, the selection by consequences, right? That's, that seems to be just a, a general principle of nature. Of, or at least of biological systems. Yeah, so to elaborate on that, and this enables uh, us to say more about the reuniting part. When an evolutionist talks about phenotypic plasticity, uh, the evolved ability of an organism to uh, respond to its environment, then there's two kinds of phenotypic plasticity, which are often called closed and open. Uh, a closed consists of a fixed repertoire. It's like plan A, B, C, and D. Yeah. And uh, you can then employ one of those plans, uh, but you can't do anything that's truly novel. And each one of those plans was basically like a, a record in a jukebox that mm. was coined during genetic evolution. Yeah. And uh, uh, the narrow school evolutionary psychology of the Cosmides and Tubi variety is, is, is very much one of closed phenotypic plasticity. Evidently, there's like hundreds of yeah, modules. modules. Right. This is called massive modularity. Massive modularity. And yeah, if you is. want to explain why we're behaving in the current day, what you need to do is you need to find the environmental trigger, the current day environmental trigger, which plays one of these 
previously cut records from the dirt box. Right. And the dirt box is a metaphor that's often used to uh, describe that. Yeah. Um, open phenotypic plasticity is more open-ended than that. And uh, for that reason, it is based on a variation in selection process. Yeah. And so in the operant conditioning case, then you have basically organisms behaving every which way. And then the ones that are reinforced uh, are, the, uh, are then adopted as behaviors. And so that is a evolutionary process built by evolution. It's an, it's yeah, a, it's that a capacity. Very, it too evolved by another evolutionary process. Sometimes it's called a Darwin machine. Uh, the word Darwin means that it's an open-ended evolutionary process where there's selection by consequences. The word machine means is that it evolved and actually has a fairly complicated structure. So, I mean, the whole concept of a reinforcer, uh, for example, is something that evolved by genetic evolution uh, that does the selecting yeah. in a more proximate uh, sense. So You mean what counts as, a, as an unconditioned reinforcer? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and then there's secondary reinforcers right. and so on. Right. So the, a really good analogy that I've employed, along with uh, Steve and, and company, is the uh, vertebrate immune system, uh, which is much better studied than other uh, systems. And it is it includes what's called an innate and adaptive component. Uh, the innate component is this closed form of phenotypic plasticity, an amazing arsenal of like automated responses yeah. that actually uh, keeps away most disease organisms, but doesn't have that open-ended flexibility. That's what the adaptive component does, which, of course, is our antibody system, uh, our ability to make approximately 100 million different antibodies. Each one acts like a hand, as it's sometimes described, yeah. capable of latching onto a narrow range of organic surfaces, uh, but collectively being able to um, grab onto almost any organic uh, surface, and then an ability to amplify the ones that actually do latch yeah. onto a, a surface. So that distinction between an innate and an adaptive component is exactly the way we need to think about our behavioral systems. And uh, it's at that point that more or less narrow school evolutionary psychology stands for the innate component. And the Skinnerian tradition, uh, now elaborated to include uh, symbolic thought, is uh, stands for the adaptive component. Now we're really getting somewhere. Yeah, that's right. Now, now we're sort of finding the bridge, uh, but also revealing the some of the reason for the 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 conflict. It's 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 sort of like the way that popular media reports things. Or, you know, uh, depression is genetic, or depression is because of your bad childhood. You know, whatever. It's, it's both, and it, and it's about sort of uh, sleuthing out how how they're they're sort of titrated and. I think that people in the that are really in the evolutionary site camp sometimes get a little bit protective of their modules, and people in the in the Skinnerian camp historically have gotten really dismissive of those those modules. Right. Well, this raises issues of literacy and science as itself a cultural adaptation, and that's actually an important point to uh, to make: is that science is an open-ended evolutionary process. Uh, it's a Darwin machine. Uh huh. But that doesn't mean that it necessarily works well. And <laughs> right. I think the idea of science working poorly and something that can, if we're more mindful about it, uh, that science can work better, you look back upon certain scientific controversies. I can mention the uh, group selection controversy. And then we've talked about the controversy over uh, these schools of psychological thought. And we've talked about social Darwinism. Uh, in each and every case, these are definitely scientific controversies. They often take decades to resolve, so they're recalcitrant. And if you look to see why, often with the benefit of hindsight, then you see, I'm, I mean, it, it didn't have to take this long. It shouldn't have taken <laughs> this long. There was a certain kind of like illiteracy, uh, lack of scholarship, and other factors which caused these controversies to be as protracted as they were. And so actually we can do better. And I think we need to think about, uh, the more we think about the scientific process in this way, that we actually can improve upon it 
and uh, and and accelerate it, cause it to cause it to work better. So one of the issues for ex- that's going to accelerate our wending of our way through these controversies is is literacy. But also, when I think about your work, especially in the last decade or so, I think about engagement, really bringing people together who are sort of on you know nominally in these these camps and having them actually engage with the, with each other. You do that yourself quite a bit. Yeah, at no, a number of levels. One is engagement among scientists. Yes. And uh, the other is, of course, engagement with the general public, and uh, which is, for example, happening at this moment through this podcast. Yeah. And um, earlier you were, um, before we got started, you were uh-huh. describing your dissatisfaction with the... Uh, little news spots, basically. Yes. If you're yeah. lucky enough to be yeah. featured on NPR or <laughs> right. Today or something right. like this, uh, that's the good For news. For your three minutes. The bad news is that uh, actually three minutes would be a long time. <laughs> so, uh, But uh, over at the Evolution Institute, where we've really been seriously applying evolution to uh, public policy, uh, we developed a, a concept that I'm proud of. I, I mean, it might not be original, but it's called the science to narrative chain. The science to narrative chain. And, uh, That's and great. What it notes is is that science uh, is necessary but not sufficient to solve the problems of modern existence. It needs to be. Uh, there also needs to be powerful narratives capable of reaching large numbers of people, and those narratives need to be connected to the science by a chain of intermediate material. Uh, of providing successive depth so that no matter where you start out on this chain, uh, you can learn more. So no matter what you currently know, in the first place you need to be engaged, and that's often with those three-minute news spots, okay? Yeah. Something that reaches very large numbers of people. And then from that point, there needs to be a way to learn more, such as a podcast. Uh And from there... A book or... Right, so that, um, so that each one points to the other, perhaps. And, and then it provides a path to the scientific literature. And in that way, uh, among other things, the, um, the narrative is held accountable yeah. to the uh, science. One reason that we developed this was uh, we were working on the topic of uh, economics. And academic economics by itself is a huge mess. Uh, we were sorting it out, actually doing a pretty good job. But then we realized we'd published like special editions of economic journals and things like that. And we realized, can I swear on air? Absolutely. Because there's shit. Yeah. Uh, Even if we do this, the disconnect between academic economics and um, economics in the public sphere is so disconnected (laughs) that we hadn't finished our job yet, had we? Yeah. And that we needed to communicate this to the... um, uh, general public, in addition to cleaning up the mess and uh, <laughs> yeah, right. on, the, on the science end. Right, right. And, uh, and we've succeeded in doing that uh, through uh, our magazine, Evonomics. Evonomics. I was going to say, I, think which I, is, uh, I wasn't that, sure that was the name. I didn't want to say it without, without more certainty, but I, thought, yeah, I do remember that. Evonomics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, l- less than a year old and now reaching awesome. um, over. Um, quarter million page views a month. So uh, this is uh, really getting out. And there is now we're doing the whole job of the science to narrative chain for the topic of economics. And then our other magazine, This View of Life, does it for um, all else. From and you've got, the, This View of Life includes things like podcasts, right? Podcasts and, oh, yeah. and articles. Um, and That's right. Yeah. That's right. And yeah. it's, it's thisviewoflife.com or what? what uh, yeah, This View of Life, type it into Google. It's an, a tremendous resource. Thank you. I'm, I'm proud really, of it. And I think it has to be um, much better, um, e- even better known. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the I could it's the sort of resource. I mean, it pulls off a kind of a magic trick for me and something that I, I don't really know how to do. And I've talked about this with a lot of scientists over the last few months doing this where you, you somehow, I, I feel comfortable pointing my mom to this view of life and not worrying too much because she's not, uh, she, you know, she didn't go to college. My parents, my, uh, you know, I'm a working class 
family background. My parents are not college graduates, but they care about stuff. One of the things that I that coming from that background has really left me feeling is that it's really not correct that people who don't have a college education are are either dumb or disinterested in science. They actually are. They're fascinated by that stuff. The trick is helping them access it. That's one trick. And by the way, you paid me the very highest compliment by saying that your mom can go to uh, this view of life. That's what uh, we... um aspire to and at the same time it's widely read by a professional audience yeah. and some of those articles probably your mom wouldn't that's want to right. read because uh, right. they go on it's for uh, all, it's 6, not words yeah. on uh, on uh, on multi-level whether, whether selection, selection or yeah and, <laughs> right yeah right and, uh, yeah, but inclusive it's nice, fitness but it's nice to uh, have both but the point i want to make is uh, is uh, that um, there's no such thing as a single common sense uh, what counts as common sense depends so much on background assumptions that every theory brings its own common sense with it. And uh, one of my favorite stories about that is uh, the young Darwin, he recounts this in his autobiography, uh, recalls taking a fossil hunting expedition with his mentor, Adam Sedgwick. Uh-huh. And they were going to a valley in Wales uh, which had no fossils because it had been scoured by glaciers. <laughs> and uh, Darwin looks back and he says, uh, you know, all the evidence for glaciers were there, the moraines, the scored rocks, the perch boulders, everything was there. He says, a house burnt down by fire did not tell its story more plainly than this valley. <laughs> uh, but the theory of glaciation had not been yet been proposed. And so they could not see that. And so they were looking for fossils. So the idea that um, we need a theory to see what's in front of our faces, and once we have that theory, then a house burnt down by fire does not tell its story more plainly, is what uh, is the main trick that has to be turned. Yeah. And once you do that, you get to, uh, and that's why this view of life, which alludes to the final passage of Darwin's Origin of Species, where he concludes his book by saying there is grandeur in this view of life. So, you know, once you adopt this view of life, then uh, it acts as a lens for viewing anything yeah. and, and is the new common sense. So uh, and anybody can, can do that. A, a mom, a, a high school student, any inquiring mind can don these glasses, basically. That's right. And uh, in my experience, which is very extensive, having created a campus-wide evolutionary studies program that teaches evolution across the curriculum and written my book, Evolution for Everyone. And I know that um, uh, more often than not, uh, people who don these glasses, uh, they never want to take them off. It's just basically it's so clarifying that it's like uh, walking through a door and not wanting, ever wanting to go back. Yeah, well, you, you have an explanation that works in short. And, and organizes experience. It organizes basically. experience. I mean, that, that, in my own experience, is exhilarating. That's oh, part totally. of what, what keeps me hooked yeah. doing the, what yeah. I do. And it, uh, and it becomes a master narrative, back to a narrative. As strong a, narr- as, strong a narrative as a religious narrative, uh, I think that uh, somebody who really gets this and gets its scope is as motivated to get out of bed and in the morning and get things done as any religious believer I, um, I know. And isn't it nice that it's a fully scientific narrative? Um, yeah. uh, doesn't require false, factually incorrect uh, beliefs. I, I'm, a, I'm someone who is an atheist who admires religion, so I'm not speaking disparagingly of religions. I think that... Uh, any worldview that that um, causes a community of people to behave well towards each other and um, outside in the, of the group. Yeah. Oh, there's. I mean, I'm not apologizing. Yeah, for, yeah, yeah. Uh, for religion, but um, but um, it's nice to to have a secular worldview that um, that can be as motivating as a as a religious worldview. And do you find that your own grasp of evolution and sort of knowledge of how evolution shaped minds to regard the world to cope with with problems to to deal with suffering and stuff is that something that gives you some distance when you're engaging with religion for example that that gives you some perspective on you know this is a religion is a thing that people do 
for for understandable reasons, whether you buy the particular narrative or not. Does that do you find that helpful in engaging with that or? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that uh, the basic and this is deeply philosophical. This is what I think basically epistemology should be based on is the recognition that every belief uh, needs to be um, evaluated by two criteria. First of all, how, uh, how does it correspond to reality? That's the scientific criterion. Uh, and secondly, what does it cause you to do? What does it cause you to do? I call these practical and factual realism. Uh, and I like those terms because the word realistic, when you think of it in natural language, actually has two very different uh, meanings. If, if you tell me something and I say that's realistic or that's not realistic, I might mean two things. One is it doesn't conform to the, the real world. Secondly, it's not very practical. Yeah, who cares? So we Angels actually, dancing on the head of a pin. We actually employ these two, these two meanings. So first of all, uh, we need to make that, that distinction. Then we need to realize that as far as evolution is concerned, our capacity to form beliefs is overwhelmingly based on their practical realism, what they cause us to do. And their correspondence to factual reality, strictly speaking, is irrelevant, right? I mean, that's, that that's follows... That's a pretty strong statement. It follows from Evolution 101. So, uh, because... Now, but there is a connection, basically. Uh, what's the relationship between perceiving the world as it really is and behaving adaptively in that world? What's the adaptive value of something which is factually correct? And the answer to that question is it's complex and very contextual. Uh -huh. uh, we can say that with confidence. There is context in which the, the more clearly you see the world as it really is, the better you can function in that world. Uh, hitting my prey over there, I need to know exactly where it is. Yeah. And so often there's a positive relationship between factual and practical realism. But in many, many other cases... Uh, we uh, behave more adaptively by departing from factual realism. So the idea of adaptive fictions, fictions which are better than fact in terms of how they cause us to behave, you know there's going to be buckets of them. And so uh, um, an adaptive worldview is going to be a mix, basically, of these two. And once you really take that on board then it does cause you to see something like religion in a new light. Because uh, what's obvious about religions and what puzzles and intrigues the scientific imagination about religions is that they do involve so many goofy counterfactual beliefs. There's no evidence for them. Right. Plus, they cause you to do costly things. Yeah. So how can they exist? And the, an the answer to that broadly, and I think this, the... the uh, study of religion from an evolutionary perspective has more or less established this, which is a great achievement, is that um, most enduring religions have what Durkheim called long ago uh, secular utility, great secular utility. Um, appearances to the contrary, these goofy beliefs and seemingly costly practices uh, do have a, a utility, and it is typically to create a, a moral community, a strong community, uh, organized around these uh, these um, these beliefs, and those uh, uh, typically evolved by between group uh, selection. And then I'd like to make a final point, which is that um, if we look at uh, all the worldviews which are not religious, we call them secular worldviews. They are also shot through with adaptive fictions. This is certainly true of economics, and it is true of actors. almost almost any ideology. Yeah. And it's even, to me, I find this disturbing just to ab um, absorb the full import of, of these very simple evolution. All of this is evolution 101, by the way. Yeah. It's so basic, it's very unlikely to be uh, wrong that just everything we think about ourselves and our cultures and our histories are shot through with the um, adaptive, adaptive value of some in fictions. Yeah, but, also, but also value, right? I mean, it, that's oh, well, values is all part that's of it. That's assumed, yeah. Well, it's values masquerading as facts. You know, it's, and it strikes me that this is actually, this, this as a principle, if this is a principle, and I think it is, it's sort of functionalist 
uh, as a principle. This is built into our basic perceptual systems physiologically, right? Totally. I mean, the, the, we, we, you know, James Gibson, I don't know if you know yep, Gibsonian know, stuff. Ecological, but, but, uh, yeah, the ecological per, per, uh, analysis of perception. And, and you know about how, you know, evolution abhors waste. You know, we don't want to be carrying a bunch of, we don't want to be perceiving every spectrum of the of, 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 yeah. of light. I make, that, I make that point quite often. So let me just uh, play that back for you. Your point played yeah. back is that if you look at basic perception, you see that every species is ignoring most things. So those things are invisible. In our case, we can't sense electrical waves or gravitational right. pulls. We see only a narrow spectrum of the light spectrum, um, narrow spect- uh, segment of the sound spectrum. And even those we distort. Mm-hmm. Uh, such as splitting for, a continuous a continuum of light into discrete colors and things like yeah uh, things like that. So that's that kind of distortion of reality takes place at the basis of our our basic organs of perception, and there's no denial of that. Yeah. Nobody denies that. Yeah, that's pretty much. And then there's just one more step. All of that is also true for our cultural beliefs. There's a book that I read recently. It's an, uh, not a new book, and it's well known um, in some circles. Its title is "Invented Traditions," and we sh- should provide our listeners with the uh, author and and so on. Uh, but it's an edited book, so Invented there's chapters. Tradition. And it recounts. Uh, this was like such a demonstration of my own theme of my own theme outside religion. Uh-huh. And the first chapter was on Scotland, and everything you might think you know about Scottish tradition, the clams, <laughs> the kilts, all yeah. that. None of it is It's true. all bullshit. Is it's it all really? invented traditions. Oh, yeah. you come on. I know, is, that, like, is that really true? I, it's, there you go. You're behaving like I did. I'm not Scottish. I have no... Yeah, I don't... I mean, I, I don't got have no skin so in the Scots game for... Irish ancestry that is utterly irrelevant to my daily life now but now if you go back and it's and it's uh, and so the and so this is what why his historical scholarship is uh, is so important the only ones with a motive to get it right are the historical scholars scholarship is like science basically uh-huh. it has a it has a goal of getting it right yeah 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 everyone else doesn't have that goal <laughs> And so, uh, but once you, but just like Darwin said about, you know, the house to, um, burned down by fire, all you have to say is this, for example, go back to uh, any pictorial representation of Scotland, yeah. of which there are many, paintings and yeah. things like that, uh, beyond a certain period of time, which is not so far ago, like 17th century or something yeah. like that, Yeah. try to find a kilt. There's no kilts. <laughs> oh, my God. I've been lied to all this time. All this time, yes. And um, so the function of the kilts and the bagpipes, maybe, and the God knows whatever else, haggis. <laughs> <laughs> that that's partly to create a, a national identity or a cultural identity, or a and the and, and then the function of that is to organize sort of social behaviors within a group. You could say. I it, mean, I'm 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 just throwing that out there. Well, and one this actually brings up some, uh, an important thing to bring up. Um, there is both an adaptive and a non-adaptive side to the evolutionary coin. And Stephen Jay Gould was tireless in reminding us that not everything that we see out there is an adaptation. The spandrel. The spandrel, the byproduct. Yes. uh, And so on. And part of what's, I think, a little subtle about being a good evolutionist is to be able to call an adaptation when you see one Yeah. and to call a byproduct when you you see one. And in the case of the history of the, the perceived uh, invented traditions of Scotland, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that's just byproduct. It's just there. Well, it has so, to do people with people create these, right? That's just what people well, do. Well, there were right? these two, these two um, <laughs> brothers who were total charlatans, and they just wanted to invent an aristocracy for themselves, and they did. And this involves, among other things, forgeries, um, uh, by which I mean. Uh, books that are written that 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 uh, that camouflage themselves as scholarly books, complete with long reference sections and things like that, and then and they're just made up. And they're in the, the interest what? of the authors that that were um, uh, wanted to establish these, and they just they had to be consciously fabricating 
Uh, there was nothing unconscious. What kind of book? What do you mean? I mean what are the? What are these? <laughs> I'm so I'm so unsettled by this. What, what kind of what kind of books are you talking I'm, about? I'm 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 bringing it up from um, memory, but I I think I remember the broad facts. So the, the problem with Scotland, way back, <laughs> was that it was like a backwater, and <laughs> and uh, nothing wrong with and that. And it turns out that it was the the, the uh, cultural transmission from from Scotland and Ireland. They were separated by water, but water was easy to, to cross, even more so than going over the mountains. So that, um, and uh, as I recall, Scotland was just like where the losers went. <laughs> <laughs> and when people wanted to... So much to, for the Scotch. And the when, Scots, I should say. And when uh, people wanted to, uh, to actually create a social identity for Scotland... They invented, as I remember, uh, and forgive uh, uh, listeners, please forgive me for not getting all the yeah. details right. No, they they no. invented a Homer. They did uh, a Scottish an Homer. His, cousin, his name was Ossian, I think. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And it, it was an invented person who who gave an antiquity to that didn't exist. Wow. And this was part of the beginning. And then the uh, the the kilts was actually. The invention of a, uh, and this is like really offending nationalistic sensibilities. Yeah, you're, you're, you're in for it. Uh, don't blame me. <laughs> this is all documented by historians. But, was a textile maker from England <laughs> who was uh, basically spinning clothing. Stop it. Clothing for. <laughs> He's going to cash in. <laughs> and then he had all these incentives to invent the kilt. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, it was expanding your market. Which in and of itself is a bit of a mystery. Incentives to build kilts. Uh, and, and to expand the market so that every clan had to have a different pattern at this point. Uh, was uh, And all of this taking place in like the 19th century and the 18th century. A completely shallow history. All uh, like a house burned down by fire. Yeah. Uh, all there to be seen uh, once you view it from this. Now, just imagine, that was just one chapter of this goddamn book. And That's then there unbelievable. was a, a chapter for every, you know, for <laughs> Wales and India oh and God. Africa, the manufacture of African about tribes. Homer. Um, yeah, what's true is... Um, what's true. And this is why I don't knock religions, I think, because everything that we associate with what's false about religion is false about uh, our knowledge. Uh -huh. and it, unless you make it your explicit goal to be a good scientist or a good scholar, then these forces will hold sway. We are lost in a funhouse of ad adaptive fictions and byproducts. Uh, and to which we're often emotionally attached. To which we are very attached, sometimes defending to our death. Yeah. yeah. So uh, it's a, a kind of a shocking uh, realization how much work is required in order to see the world the way it really is, which and it's never that's been right. more important to do so. That's why they call it a discipline, right? It's a discipline. I think, yeah, I think yeah. it. Um, it it's is not. It's not intuitive necessarily. The act of uncovering factual, you know, you know, of approaching verisimilitude, you know, reality, yeah. is not is not an intuitive approach. But needed. But <laughs> desperately, desperately needed. Yeah. Wow. So where did you? Where did? How did you? Where did you get started? Were you? you, you where are you from? Are you from? The, the east, like northeast? I'm from the east. I've told this story elsewhere, but uh, very, very briefly. Um, my, uh, my dad was a famous novelist. He wrote The Man in the Gray Flannel Suit in a Summer Place. Holy shit. Biggest bestsellers. And I was uh, admired him, but didn't think I could ever measure up to him. Yeah. And so my boyish solution was to um, uh, do something he would respect but couldn't possibly understand. That sounds I like a good I plan. I succeeded at that. Yeah, <laughs> that and sounds so, like a good solution. And so I became a scientist, and um, I also love nature. So as soon as I realized I could be a scientist who studied nature, in other words, an ecologist, that's the kind of scientist I became. Yeah. And I was lucky to enter, to be trained, at a time when historically, the fields of ecology, evolution, and behavior which are historically separate disciplines, were fusing. In behavioral ecology? Is this yeah, all of that. 1970s, yeah. 1970s was when Dobjansky I'm, said, yeah. nothing in biology makes sense except in the light, in the light of, of evolution. evolution yeah. It was the 1975 was the publication of sociobiology. 
Yeah. And I was a graduate student then. So uh, this is, was part of my, my training. And uh, as soon as I realized that the evolutionary lens could be uh, trained on humans, then I realized that I could do the same novelistic enterprise as my dad, because uh, that's what a novelist does, tries to understand the human condition. Sure. Uh, my dad did it through the lens of his personal experience. I realized that I could do that through the lens of evolutionary theory. And so that gave me a special attraction for studying humans from an evolutionary perspective. What, um, what, what scandalized many people about the final chapter of Ed Wilson's sociobiology had positive appeal to me and others. Yeah. So I was among the, the first to jump on the idea of human behavior from an evolutionary perspective uh, in the 1970s. One, one of the first books I read as an undergraduate was On Human Nature. Yeah, so, uh, and it's interesting. Ed Wilson is an interesting figure. We could spend yeah, a lot of time on yeah, him. Yeah. Uh, just to say one thing about it, though, uh, he had a long, long interview with a colleague of mine. Uh, it lasted for a couple of hours in which he went through his own life story from this sense. And uh, I was, I actually transcribed that interview. So I, 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 I you typed did? it. You typed so, it? Because uh, it was for this view of Stop life. Stop it. You said and it took oh me hours God. to. Uh, it must have. But it penetrated more than if I had just, uh, if I had just read it. So um, Ed Wilson was a young assistant professor at Harvard at the same time as Francis Crick. And he said that nobody thought that the inheritance code was, go was, was going to be cracked that soon. Uh, and when when their paper came out, Watson and Crick and the it was Watson. I'm sorry, it was uh, Watson, not Crick. Okay. that was at Harvard. Got it. Yeah. And uh, in the 1950s, Ed Wilson could see the writing on the wall. He knew that this was going to be so huge. He basically saw the future of molecular biology and molecular genetics. And he knew that every position at Harvard in the biology department was going to be thrown in that direction if something were not done, and that his field was somehow had to match He had to this. come up with a similar, a statement of similar strength. He had to somehow compete for evolutionary biology, whole organism biology, to compete with, with uh, what was going to take place in molecular biology. And so as he thinks of it, and I'm not sure he's so wrong, he deliberately went about to do such things as put natural history on a more quantitative foundation. Mm -hmm. He worked with Robert MacArthur, and that was the beginning of a more quantitative approach to ecology. Uh, that um, was an incredible time. Island biogeography uh, was another quantified approach. Then sociobiology, then, uh, then on human nature, uh, deliberately trying to upgrade whole organism biology, modernize it, uh, in order to keep pace with molecular biology. It's just an incredible contribution. Yeah. And so, so when he's doing that, when he's writing those books, you're, you're coming through grad school or you're finishing up grad school in the 70s, the, the mid-70s? Right. He, uh, and where were you at? I, I got my PhD at, um, at uh, Michigan State. Okay. And I started out as an aquatic ecologist studying zooplankton. But part of this fusion meant that I realized I didn't have to be like the old joke about the um, expert learning more and more about less and less until yeah. they know everything about nothing. Um, <laughs> I could study anything from with my evolutionary tool. That's right. Yeah, that's right. And, and so, uh, so although my starting point was uh, zooplankton, by the time I got done with grad school, I was an all-purpose evolutionary biologist. And my first article on group selection was written as a graduate school. It was a model. And I immediately uh, knew its import, and I contacted Ed Wilson to ask him to uh, sponsor it for the proceedings of the National Academy of, of Sciences. So that was in As 1974, a, a year before sociobiology. So I, I went, I met him, and uh, he ended up doing just that. So, um, so I was a grad student just finishing up at the time when sociobiology came out. I was briefly at Harvard on a postdoc, not with him. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later on, a lot later on, we uh, started to co-author articles together. Yeah. But that wasn't until 2007. 
Got it. Right. And that first s- statement of group selection was very, very theoretical, like a, a possibility. I haven't read that particular paper, but but the, was it a sort of a statement of possibility or did you feel like you had sort of were, were moving towards solving? Well, at that time, group selection had been um, much maligned. Well, it had been dismissed kind of yeah. categorically. And so the consensus was that uh, that uh, a group selection is almost invariably weak compared to individual if it, level if it, selection. If it even exists at all, right? Well, the consensus was, and it's very important to establish this, because I think actually memory is fading about the group selection controversy, and that's not a good thing. So let's spend just a couple of minutes yeah, uh, yeah, on it. Sure. So... I like to say that uh, if you go back to the Christian worldview, <laughs> it's, uh, it's very much that uh, if the world was created by an omniscient and beneficent God, then it must be harmonious from top to bottom, from the smallest insect to the, uh, to the heavenly bodies. Right. And the first Enlightenment thinkers, such as Isaac Newton, although they were placing their authority on science and reason, not scripture, they thought that science and reason would affirm the Christian worldview uh, in this respect. Yeah. And what was shocking and disturbing about evolution was the possibility that the kind of harmony and order, functional design that we associate with a uh, human implement such as a watch or a single organism such as an insect might cease to exist at a higher scale such as a social group or an ecosystem, not to speak right. of the cosmos. So the idea of order leading to disorder is the shocking possibility that was introduced by evolutionary theory. And Darwin was led to this conclusion by contemplating traits that are for the good of the group, the traits that are, would be considered moral in human terms, altruism, honesty, bravery. And he realized that these traits did not give an individual an advantage compared to other individuals within the same group. The advantage would go to the selfish individual. The individual that behaves immorally in human terms would, uh, would beat out, would, would exploit the moral individual within the same group. And so that was the dilemma. And the solution to the dilemma that Darwin realized was that even though selfishness beats altruism within groups, as Ed Wilson and I put it, uh, groups of altruists would robustly outcompete groups of selfish individuals, so that if natural selection operates on groups, then there would be an evolutionary force favoring all of the traits that we associate with morality in in human terms for the good of the group traits. So as Ed Wilson and I summarized in our 2007 article, selfishness beats altruism within groups, altruistic groups beat selfish groups, everything else is commentary. There is your theory of social behavior standing on one foot. So what happened, and now this remains true. Um, this is what everyone should, should uh, learn, and this is basically the logic of multilevel selection. What actually happened in the history of evolutionary thought was that, uh, in the first place, that clarity was um, lost. As important as this was, it was actually marginalized by even more important things. Just imagine that at that time, people were trying to figure out the basic mechanism of inheritance, uh, uh, reconciling Mendelism with, yeah, sure. with Darwinism. Right. And so the three uh, main pioneers of population genetics, uh, Ronald Fisher, Sewell Wright, and J.B.S. Haldane, mm-hmm. each considered this group selection problem briefly, uh, more or less building uh, simple models emulating the logic, the verbal logic of, of uh, Darwin, but none of them paid it much attention. And the other biologists who weren't, didn't even know about population genetics uh, often assumed naively that uh, adaptations could evolve at all levels of the biological hierarchy, or if they understood that group selection was, was needed, they assumed that group selection easily trumped within group selection, and so that there was basically not a problem invoking adaptation above the level of the individuals. And it was not until the 1960s that this basically began to occupy center stage in evolutionary biology. This was after the modern synthesis. Yes. The modern synthesis took place in the 1940s. Right. Uh, And uh, G.C. Williams is the major figure there, and he actually 
the anecdote. I knew him well. He was a good friend of mine. Oh, yeah. Despite huh. the fact that we were on opposite ends of the group selection controversy. So what actually happened was he was trained in, he had good evolutionary training at, at UC Berkeley. And then his first postdoc was at, um, at the University of Chicago. And um, that was the home of, of ecologists such as uh, W.C. Alley, who were naive group selectionists. Alley was a termite biologist. And of course, termites. Naive group selectionists. Well, mm. I mean, that naive is always a retrospective designation, sure, isn't it? Sure. So Allie was a termite biologist. Uh -huh. uh, you, I mean, termites are superorganisms, but he but over. But they also are highly genetically. Well, none of that was known at the time. Okay. I mean, that was right, all, right, right. That's right. Yeah. Um, they were definitely uh, a group organisms. We know that today. Sure. But he overgeneralized. He thought all of nature was like a termite colony. And he didn't have the clarity of thought of population genetics or anything like that. So Williams right. encounters this, and he, he, and he understands that they have no theoretical foundation to this. And so that's why he writes, he begins to write his book, Adaptation and Natural Selection. So what the book says, it, first of all, it affirms the logic of multilevel selection. Basically, you cannot invoke adaptation at any level without also invoking a process of selection at that level. No group level adaptation without a process of group level selection. That's what Darwin said. He affirmed that logic. But then in step two, he made an empirical claim that as a matter of fact, that group level adaptation seldom evolved because group selection is seldom strong enough to counteract within group selection. And then that became the consensus view. And by the time that I was on the scene, then that was the dogma. Uh, and dogma is the right word because it was just like taboo. Uh, it was well, it was dogma, but also you had uh, inclusive fitness theory uh, to turn to and, and then Hamilton's rule and, and all uh, of these kinds of things. And these were all treated as uh, developed and treated as alternatives to group selection. Well, in, in the way I read it, I mean, as an undergraduate, even in the 80s, was that they were canonically the solution to the problem of altruism and cooperation and social hypersociality. Right, and they didn't invoke group selection. No, no. no so no. Uh, no, I read on human nature and selfish gene. Those right. are my like my entrees to to evolutionary biology. Yeah, and so what my model showed, which was purely a, a algebraic model, yeah, a really it's, simple it's a math one, model. Uh, so it wasn't connected to any particular organism, but um, in the first place, its main innovation was that it defined a group as a set of individuals that influence each other's fitness with respect to the trait that's being studied. Mm -hmm. And that sounds complicated, but basically what it duplicates is, in the first place, the way groups are, are used in, in common language. When we say my class, my society, my family, my army, my whatever, we're always talking about collections of individuals in relation to a certain activity. And so the, the definition of the group is, is joined at the hip with a particular activity. In an evolutionary model for social behaviors, you need to determine the fitness of an individual. And if it's a social behavior, that requires identifying the set of individuals that are influencing the fitness of a given focal individual. Well, in, in, as, in as much at least as the social group is part of the individual's ecology. Right. So if you're, stu if you're, if you're studying a warning cry, the evolution of a warning cry, the salient group is the birds with an earshot. Yeah. Um, if you're studying resource conservation, uh, not overexploiting your resource, the salient group is the group of individuals that are drawing upon the same you know, I always get that part. The part that I always get hung up on is the statement that that within group selection always favors the selfish. Because why is that true? I mean, why, well, why not? In the I mean, first I, place, it's not as true as a general rule. There are exceptions. Yeah. And the reason it's true as a general rule is a basic matter of trade-offs. Um, here's an easy way that I sometimes describe this. Imagine that you're playing the game of Monopoly, okay? Yeah. And I offer you a thousand monopoly dollars, but that's subject to the condition that I give everyone else that you're playing with uh, two thousand monopoly dollars. Uh, you are wise to reject my offer, because relative wealth is all that counts in the game of monopoly. And now imagine that I change the the game. 
uh, we're going to have a Monopoly tournament. And so there's many groups of people playing Monopoly. And the winner of the tournament is the one that develops their, collectively develops the properties faster than any other of the groups. That's the Monopoly tournament. The way you play the game of Monopoly in the tournament is going to be utterly and completely different than the way that you play the game of Monopoly when you're just trying to beat the other players within your uh, group. And so generalizing from that, if you are in any situation to think about the traits that maximize relative standing within a group, as a rule, as a pretty good rule, those will not be the same traits that will be required to uh, maximize the welfare of the group. And, and so it's that basic trade-off. As a basic matter of trade-offs, you can't do A, if, if A and B are different things, then what it takes to maximize A is, with some exceptions, not going to maximize B is holes for maximizing relative fitness within groups versus maximizing the fitness of the group relative to other groups in, the, in a, in a multi-group population. Interesting. I get, I, you know, I get, I guess when I think in terms of selection, I maybe, maybe part of what I get hung up on is the concept of altruism generally, because altruism from a strictly evolutionary biology perspective is a pretty strong statement. Altruism is, you know, sacrificing my reproductive capability for another. And I keep wondering whether that's getting conflated with cooperation, which is a different kind of thing. Cooperation doesn't necessarily entail uh, me forfeiting my possibility for reproduction, but it does potentially increase my fitness a lot because if we pool resources, then we create scale economies, right? We, we, you know, we pay half as much for twice, twice the gain, right? Uh, and so cooperation, it seems, could fuel pro-social behaviors uh, within groups pretty powerfully. Right, so there you raise a great point, and it's well worth spending some time on, and then you can chop up this interview however much you want. <laughs> it's, uh, and so what this calls uh, up is a distinction between uh, a relative fitness thinking versus absolute fitness thinking. And to understand multilevel selection theory, you have to be thinking in relative fitness mode and you have to be applying that in this nested level. So what's the fitness of a gene relative to other genes within the same individual? Uh -huh. What's the fitness of an individual relative to other individuals within the same groups? What's the fitness of the group relative to other groups in the multigroup population? Got it. Got it. Now, if you do that, and if you take a trait that anyone would consider cooperative, and I find this so ironic because once you are thinking in relative fitness mode, this is another thing that's... a Evolution 101 no-brainer. <laughs> so let's say that there's something that uh, that we can do together. Yeah. And we, we can both move get the table equal together. benefits. Yeah. Uh, I gain, you gain. Shouldn't we do it? Well, maybe. But uh, if you do that set of comparisons, the fact is, is that there's no fitness differences between us if it's a win-win situation. Do you see what I mean? I call this a no-cost public good. So, so let's say that it's possible for an individual to do something that benefits its entire group, including itself, at no cost to itself. This is unrealistic, but it's yeah, useful. that does yeah, that's not what. And so, imagine a group where there's 20% of these individuals. Thanks to them, everyone does better. What's the proportion of those individuals after they act? Everyone's doing better. But what's their proportion? They started out at 20%. What, how, where do they end up? And I hope that you're saying, thinking, 20%. Mm -hmm. Well, evolution requires differences. And yeah. There's no differences yeah, in yeah. that scenario. Um, now, if you now have a multi-group population and the groups vary in their proportion of these no-cost public good providers, even if there's only one of them in the entire world, and so that means there's one group with one of those, with that mutant individual, that group will do better than other groups. But the fitness difference is at the between group level is not at the difference uh, at the level of within individual, between individuals within groups. So actually you need group selection in order to evolve a no cost public good, what anyone would call cooperation. Even if you factor in the development of reputation and, and the, the sharing at different points in time, Right, uh, so what, so uh, Sarah Blaffer Hurdy's thing about right. uh, you know cooperative breeding. So this is like, and I'm not, I'm not, uh, I, I don't. Please don't take this as a criticism. Yeah, but this is like my standard sequence of ideas when yeah, I when okay. I when I when I talk about this. So I might say, as I do in my lectures, after getting through the 
the no cost public good example. Yeah. Said, you might think that a system of rewards and punishment would uh, be able to do some work here. Yeah. But if you think carefully about it, then these are what's called second order public goods. If I reward you for being a solid citizen or if I punish you for not, uh, then I'm providing a public good of my own. And the same problem so that, re- reproduces so then it, itself. Then it, it's another iteration of the same problem, yeah. And so the the dismal conclusion is <laughs> is that, and this is what Williams asserted in 1966, is that natural selection within groups is insensitive to the welfare of the group. Anything that floats all boats or sinks all boats it's, is it's not visible yeah, yeah. because it doesn't generate differences. But don't be too alarmed because... It actually does generate differences at the between group level. And often, random variation is enough. In the case of a no cost public good, then what you get is that it's neutral as far as within group selection, neither for or against, right? It's not weighing, natural selection within groups isn't weighing against the no cost uh-huh. public good. There's uh-huh. a zero as far as within group selection is concerned. And so, therefore, any amount of group selection, based on any variation among groups, it doesn't even have to be random variation, just any variation above, above zero, will select a no-cost public good. Um, that's why we see them. Uh, but please credit between group selection for it. Don't credit within group Because it selection. changes the social ecology, and the social ecology gets, gets basically iteratively selected for. Yeah, so, so if by altruism you're thinking in absolute fitness terms, yeah. is that I benefit you and my absolute fitness goes down, yeah. and that is how many people think about altruism, yeah. then there's another category we call it cooperation. Yeah. We envision it as a win-win situation and so on. But if you're thinking in relative fitness terms, then most of the things that you think about in terms of uh, as cooperation actually are altruistic when we think of altruism in relative fitness terms. So, uh, and the prisoner's dilemma, um, all of these things, if you look at them, count as altruistic. But if I could uh, return quickly to my model, my first model. Sure, sure. So one innovation of the model was to come up with an extremely general definition of groups. Uh, And it pointed out that actually any model of social evolution, no matter what it's called, is going to define groups like this because they can't even get going as models. Uh-huh. You can't even... So, so all theories of social behavior are multi-group theories. They all have to postulate that social interactions take place in, in, uh, in groups that are small compared to the total population. That's, that's a biological uh, reality. And then the model showed that um, actually between group selection cannot be dismissed categorically. It doesn't always trump within group selection, but neither can it be dismissed out of hand. Right. And um, so that conclusion was sufficiently general that without applying it to any particular case, it was a game changer compared to the background assumption of that time, which was that group selection could be categorically. Now, was that the start of, I mean, did you start the change of mind or change of heart in Ed Wilson as well? I mean, with with that with that paper, because uh, the at least the story that I understand, he's not thinking in group selection terms or talking about group selection much before then. Right. That's the way. Again, that's the. You can't exactly say it's a legend because Will, Wilson is still around. Ed yeah. Wilson is still around. Yeah, there, yeah, but, yeah. But the, I think actually my my reading of that, and this, this could all be validated, and Ed, I think will have. I think will validate him <laughs> himself is that um, back then when he wrote sociobiology and two years later, actually the chapter on group selection and sociobiology was also published as a um, article in 1973. He was giving the most sympathetic interpretation to group selection that he possibly could. And uh, nobody at the time, including Hamilton, appreciated that that kin selection was a form of group selection. Um, and Hamilton arrived at that. Didn't Hamilton come around with that? Yes, in 1975, based on his encounter with George Price. So that timeline is that uh, before that, Hamilton developed his theory as an alternative to group selection. And then he encountered this enigmatic figure, George Price, who came up with a statistical partitioning method which has become known as the Price Equation. Mm -hmm. And what it did was it partitioned selection in the total population 
uh, what evolves all things considered into within and between group components. Yeah, I think of it as a, as a regression, basically, a regression equation with different weights. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, and so basically what Price did was similar to what I did. It was a, it was a very general model that showed that you could not dismiss uh, the between group component out of hand. The, the between group component in, in uh, the Price equation is, is not always small compared to the within group. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Hamilton saw this right away. And when he translated his own theory into uh, the Price equation, he could see that what was causing altruism to evolve in his own theory was between group selection. In other Shit. words, in other that was words, a big shock. <laughs> yeah, and he writes about it in his own autobiography. And this is another thing where this is why I was saying that the controversy didn't need to drag out as long as it did. It should have been over by the 1980s. Uh, should have been resolved. And the fact that it's still not over in some sense. Or no, 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 it's still not. I mean, it's it's all over the place. I mean, I have... This is showing been, you what's not working about science. No, that's right. But, the, but you know, this is part of why I admire what you've been up to trying to get people together, trying to trying to sort of solve the problem, not just the problem of... Not just the, the intellectual problem, the, the, but the, the scientific problem, but the problem. Accept, but yeah, but the sort of sociology of science problem. That, yeah. That, that, that that's... That's also impeding progress, and I and I, that's something I that's a belief I strongly share, and that's part of why I'm doing these strange outreach kinds of things now. I think I'm I'm intuiting the same kind of thing that you have, which is that when we behave badly, we impede scientific progress as well as as much as anything else. There's a a, a scholarly book uh, by Steve Shapin called "The Social History of Truth." And it is, uh, it is basically a cultural history of the emergence of scientific norms. And uh, I'm not sure his thesis is quite correct, but the, what the thesis is, is that the norms of science emerged from British gentlemanly society. And this was like a genteel society which calls for certain kinds of conduct, uh, of like civility. Roberts rules or something. Of politics. civility. Yeah, yeah. And that we are going to have a civil discussion and we're going to hold ourselves accountable to the results of our experiments and so on and, and so forth. And there's some things that you do not do. And I think that there's been an erosion of that in the first place. There were, you know, maybe none of that was explicit. That could be true. But um, I think there's a lot of scientific conduct that's um, eroding that. And we, we think we need to think carefully about about uh, science as a social construction that can work well or poorly, and that we need to think of the design of science more than we do. And if we were more mindful about it, then there'd be it would it would proceed better. And it would not take a fucking half century <laughs> for that, that. That's like you know uh, um, more than twenty five percent of the history of evolutionary thought, folks. Yeah. I want you to yeah to know that it was not required, and it does not reflect well upon uh, scientists and the whole educational method that most people are taught about group selection in the most fundamentalist way. It's just what they learn is uh, nobody thinks this, uh, uh, you shouldn't either, and the underlying logic they seldom learn. And then they're like any boob, they're, they're just, uh, they, they don't do what's prohibited in their, in their society. And if you try to suggest otherwise, then they just don't have the resources to to, that's how this has been transmitted. This and other things have been has been transmitted. It's, it does not reflect well yeah. upon the scientific uh, process, and it's not the only not the only case. We can do better. Yes, indeed. Well, on that note, David Sloan Wilson, thank you so much for talking with me today. <laughs> thank you. It's such short notice, too. And thanks for uh, doing what you do, basically, because this is one of the things that's going to upgrade. The um, not only um, literacy in the general public, but uh, scientific conduct among the scientists. Yeah, well, thanks. I'll, I'll keep at it. Okay, that's it. Very many thanks to David Sloan Wilson for sitting down with me for that stimulating and enjoyable chat. And uh, now, b believe it or not, David 
calling him by his first name now because we became friends. David had such a nice time during our chat, that chat you just heard, that the very next day he decided to sort of turn the tables and interview me about an aspect of my career, specifically my discovery of behavioral ecology and how that discovery sort of radically changed the way I view my own scientific work. And uh, I'm planning on releasing that conversation shortly as, as sort of David Sloan Wilson bonus material. So watch out for that. Okay? Folks, the music on Circle of Willis is written by Tom Stoffer and Gene Ruley and performed by their band, The New Drakes. For information on how to purchase their music, check the About page at circleofwillispodcast.com. Don't forget that Circle of Willis is brought to you by VQR and the Center for Media and Citizenship at the University of Virginia. And, and that Circle of Willis is a member of the Tej FM network. You can find out more about that at teej.fm. People, if you like this podcast, how about giving us a little review at iTunes? Letting us know how we're doing. It's super easy. And we like it. We do. I say that every time. I'm saying it again. Or you can send us an email by going to circleofwillispodcast.com and clicking on the contact tab. (sighs) In any case, I will see you at episode 11 where I talk with neuroscientist Nicole Prousey about, well, about sex. She studies sex and... uh, And I have a hard time talking about genitals, but we got through it, and I'm excited for you to hear it. Until then, bye-bye. Nothing to stop me. I'm chasing.